Are you a fan of The Celebrity Apprentice? Well, if you are, you just may have seen my next guest. He's the former CMO of Kodak, and he's responsible for one of the biggest business turnarounds in history. In fact, Forbes magazine has dubbed him the Celebrity CMO. And now Jeff Hazlett is with me, and he has authored a new book. It's called The Mirror Test, and he's sharing our, his business expertise, marketing savvy in this book. And in fact, a lot of the experts are saying it's a reflection of sheer marketing genius. So Jeff, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. It sounds like something Donald Trump would write. Probably. Doesn't it though? I know. Well, you kind of know Donald. I right? do know Donald, yeah. and that's his real hair in real life. So. You know, I've had the pleasure of meeting him myself. He's really a lot taller than... He's very yes. big. He's a very big guy. Yes, he is. So anyway, so we'll move on and not talk about the Donald because we want to talk about you and the book, The Mirror Test. Why did you write the book? Well, you know, people were coming out of this recession, and I thought it was time for us to talk about something to get us going again. I'm talking about growth, and we all learn when we're Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts to find out when you come across a body that might be injured, you hold a mirror to their mouth to see whether they're going to breathe or not. You know, we had to do that at Kodak. I think a lot of businesses out there have to do that for themselves. You know, will the dog eat the dog food? You know, why are you in the game? And you have to take a look at yourself and look in the mirror and really ask yourself some very hard questions. And that's really what the whole book is about. That is really tough because when you look in the mirror, and I guess you just have to be brutally honest about what's happening in your business. And when you're building it and you're running it and it's your baby, that's got to be a hard thing to do. It is tough, but that's what leaders are supposed to do. You know, at Kodak, my job was to create tension wherever I was at, to move everybody from the center of the table to the edge of the table and, and really get them going, get that innovation back in the company. And business leaders need to do that. And I found myself, you know, sitting in meetings going, someone ought to do something, and then finally realized, that's me. And so that's the way it is for most small business owners. You're not only the CEO, but you're also the chief listening officer, listening to this stuff going out in social media as well, or whatever it might be. And you really got to look in the mirror and say, the person staring back at you is responsible for it. One of my favorite lines, as I always say, as a small business owner, you take out the trash and collect the cash. So you do <laughs> it all, right. right. One of the things I found interesting in your book, though, is, and I've been in business for many years, I won't say how many, but you talk about ROI, which we think uh, of as return on investment, but you give it a new meaning. So what... Yeah. Well, a lot of people come to me and they'll say, Jeff, what's the ROI on this campaign? And mostly financial people. And I'll say, I don't know, I'll tell you what the return on investment is when you tell me what the return on ignoring is. Our, our primary job should be in marketing is listening to customers. Our primary job as business owners or leaders is should be listening to customers, capture customer behavior. And so, you know, a lot of people are going, well, with this social media stuff, why are we investing money? Why are we doing it? Well, you want to listen to your customers. That's what you should have been doing all along, but we've moved everything to a 1-800 number with a press 1, press 2, press 3, and we still don't listen to customers. This is giving us a great way to do that, and it pays off. It's OPM, other people's money. It's a great way for you to be able to utilize new technology, new ways of doing things with an old return to it. I saw a research study not too long ago about competitive comparisons and differentiations, and it said that really most CEOs, if you ask them to say their key differentiator, that they just gave real standard marketing buzz messages. Exactly. So what you're saying is really this will help you define that. Absolutely. In fact, one of the biggest concepts in the book, The Mirror Test, is the 118, the new elevator pitch. And that's really what a lot of folks are getting to, and they're picking up on it. I, at Kodak, I had hundreds of people coming and sell to me, and they they would be 30-page PowerPoint presentations. At the end of the hour, I still didn't know what they did. So I said I wanted to redefine the elevator pitch. Could make it called the elevator pitch 2.0 or the digital version of it, and I call it the 118. And it's real simple. I found out eight seconds is the average attention span of any adult. I, it's true. I looked oh, at, that's really sad, yeah, isn't it? I, I, I thought it, it was just me with my ADD, but okay. It's everybody, and I, I found it to be true because it's on the internet, right? Okay, all right, that's right. Got to believe that. Right? And then 110 seconds is the average elevator ride in New York City. From the time you press the button, wait for it to show up, doors open, you step on, ride up or ride down, and get off. So that's it. You have eight seconds to grab my attention, 110 seconds to sell me. And that's really what you should be doing. That eight seconds should be some kind of statement that gets that lean in factor. And we all know what that is being in business for ourselves or when you're selling something. When someone starts leaning into the conversation, that's really important. And then the 110 seconds should be around closing me. Tell me the value statements, the unique value statements or proposition that you have for your business that's different than everyone else. Don't waste all your time telling me, well, I work with Coca-Cola, I work with this company, I work with this company, I work with this company. I could care less. Tell me what you're going to solve for me. 
you know, if Moses can do it with two tablets of five bullet points each, you know, a business owner can do it in a lot less time because they got something a lot easier to sell. I, I agree with that 100%. One of the other things you say, though, is for a business owner to step back and examine and answer three questions of the three reasons why you're doing what you're doing. Let me turn that around on you, Jeff. What are the three reasons you're doing what you're doing? Well, it's really, it's always been the same for me. And I learned that's very early in life. I've been an entrepreneur. I've worked for major corporations like Kodak's. Uh, Kodak, this was the longest uh, job I've ever held for four years and one month when the average for a CMO is 19 months. So I stayed on a lot longer. But for me, it's three things. One, am I having fun? That's got to be a key for me. Two, am I building wealth for my family? And the third thing is, am I growing professionally? Am I getting what I want to get out of it intellectually? And so for me, those are the three key questions. And I think it should be the same for most business leaders and most uh, business owners. And if you're solving those kinds of things, well, I mean, that's a blast. And you got to have them all. You also talk about the importance as business leaders of being aware. But as running a business, as we talked, you're busy doing so many things, you're, and you're just the day-to-day -day operations. How do you lift your head up and really become aware of as a business leader? Well, you have to. You have to take some time to do it. Whether, you know, I, say, I always say in business, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> and so I want to know the things I don't know because that's where I find the aha moments. That's where I find the things that I can go out and do or add to a product or add as a service, you know, or listen to my customers. So take the time, whether it's every Friday, when I used to own a printing operation in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I would pick up the phone and call 10 customers and say, hey, we delivered jobs to you this week. How was it? Were you happy? Were you displeased? I mean, I'd want to know those kinds of conversations. Now you can do it with social media. Do, you know, uh, word searches to find out what they're saying about you online because they're saying things about you online and you want to know those things. Or if you're in a public company, check the chat rooms, do a lot of those kind of things. You'll find out a lot about your company you didn't know existed just by being unaware. And actually, you are on, on social media. You're everywhere. I love to follow you. What, and what's your Twitter handle? It's at Jeffrey Hazlett, H-A-Y-Z-L-E-T-T. -T. I'm one of the top 10 C-level executives of Twitter, and I, I love to do it. Great. It's a great way for me to keep in touch with my family and now with uh, lots of fans right. of the Mirror Test. Yeah, I keep up with you. I know where you are just about all the time, <laughs> so that's wonderful. But what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing business owners make? I, I just read something recently out of all the... Fortune 500 companies and all the accounts out there, so many of them are stagnant. Well, they're stagnant, and that's one thing. So you're not being, you know, real in terms of being timely. So timely is one thing because you want to continue to be timely, but more importantly, you want to be authentic. You want to be real, and and with social media, you're going to have to be extremely transparent because you're going to be found out. So if you, you know, suck in real life you'll suck online and that's the way I like to describe it you know if you're a jerk offline and then you know you're a jerk online as well so those are the kind of things you want to think about as you move forward so all those little things that are hidden not being online will certainly show up in social media so you want to be very authentic you know, I think that one of the things that people ask me sometimes is, well, I'm doing all these things, but I'm not converting them into sales. But really, it's about networking in cyberspace. I mean, it's building relationships. It's about building a relationship, building a community. That's what you want to do. You know, I can go out tomorrow and make you an overnight success with a viral video. I can do that. Given the time and the money, that's what I do for a living. Now, but the key thing is they'll leave you just as fast as they came to you. So why not take the time, build a community, and what I talk about, don't worry about eyeballs and ears, worry about hearts and minds, and build those hearts and minds over time. So it's about building that community. But I can tell you, it will lead to sales. And for those people who don't think it doesn't, you're crazy because you can sell things. I mean, be searching for people who are looking to buy a product that you might be selling or a service and then contact them. Be out, you know, be outrageous a little bit. Go ahead. People don't mind that. People like to be contacted. People like to build friends. And that's what you want to do. And I, when they feel like they can trust you, when they feel like you're the authority, that you have credibility, then naturally they're going to turn to you when they want to buy a product or service. Exactly. And that's the reason why you want to build that relationship early and build it over a length of time and build that community. Now, I do have one question that I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on, but you are still a proponent of print. Oh, um, yeah. So, because, you know, we hear all about print media is dead, 
Why do you say that print is still? It's crazy. I'm, I'm, I am a big ambassador for print, one of the biggest ones since Gutenberg, probably, <laughs> from that, both in size and then of my intensity around it. But I like all campaigns, and I think blended campaigns. To say that print's not going to be around, books are going to be around for a long time, newspapers are going to be around for a long time, magazines are still going to be around for a long time, and most of the people watching, in their lifetimes, they're still going to be around. The key thing is to do it smartly. And so I like print that's individualized, customized. I don't like the junk mail, but I like highly customized version print material that's really attuned to me. It makes me feel good. I still like that mail moment. I think most people do too. The problem is we've used it very poorly, just like we're using email as marketers very poorly. And I'm concerned about the mobile technology being used incorrectly and that we lose the trust with the, one of the most personal items in the world, and that's your phone. So there's a lot of different things. So I think there's going to be a resurgence of print. I think it's going to continue to be there. And I think it's still a very strong medium. But use it in a blended campaign. Don't just you know put all your eggs in one basket because I think you'll be making a big mistake when it comes to marketing. And when you come, even when you're talking about the mobile, I mean, you have to be so careful of that because as consumers, we are so tired about having our privacy invaded. So exactly. Yeah. And the first time you send me an unsolicited mail, I'm going to take that phone and throw it through your front window. There you so, go. Yeah. And that's the way people feel about a phone. Just sure. take their phone away once. They'll let you take their children before they take their <laughs> phone. So, you know, that's going to be the, the next big thing. And, and then how that really well, you know, puts together inside of video. Video with the mobile mm -hmm. will be a big thing for the future. Great, great to know. Now, one thing we share in common, although you were a much bigger success than I, but we both have corporate backgrounds. I was an EVP with a Fortune 100 company in marketing. But we both have been in small business too. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the key differences and or and, and or similarities? Because a lot of people are making yeah. those transitions today. There's no difference. I tell people, I, I talk about this in the book, The Mirror Test. What's the difference between a business on Main Street in a small town and a business in Wall Street? Just zeros. <laughs> the zeros. So there might be 27 employees here in the small business in Main Street and 27,000 business in the big Wall Street company. The only difference is the number of zeros behind the number. Same problems at the little business as I got at the big business. Just, you know, Escalated. magnified. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Same kind of politics, same kind of uh, opportunities. Everything's the same. And what makes good for a small business in Main Street is good for a big business just with bigger scale. And so that's really the difference. And, and that's the way I've always approached it. Maybe call it my South Dakota, you know, pragmatist kind of mentality. But that's the way I look at it. We all put on our boots the same way, our jeans the same way. And so I see the differences being the same. And there's more similarities. And the more I travel around the world, quite frankly, mm -hmm. the more similarities I see among all people and all businesses. I tell you, business is particularly small business is sort of a common denominator no matter where you travel in the world. Exactly so right. And it's great to see, you know, our, you know, typically what I call the free enterprise system and what we've known as the American way of yeah. doing business is, is absolutely everywhere. Well, you know what? I want to have you back and we'll talk about that sometime because Fantastic. that's one of my passions. So well, thank you. Well, and before you go, we talked about your Twitter handle. You also have a website. What's yep. your website? Hazlett.com, H A Y Z L E T T dot com, and that's where you can pick up the book and okay. learn more about where we're at. And I have a collection, that's why we're sitting in front of this big bookcase, of great business books. So I hope before you leave you'll autograph your book for me so I can add it to the collection. Love to sign yours and everyone who, who buys one, you <laughs> okay. bet. Okay, great. And just so that you don't have to remember the website, uh, it's hazelit.com, but we will have a link to that website on our homepage, which is itsyourbiz.com. And remember, when you're there, you can get more tips, advice, and resources for helping you succeed in your business. We want to stay connected with you. Today, millions of Americans are choosing to leave their traditional career paths behind and reinvent themselves in becoming their own boss. I call them second chapter entrepreneurs. And joining me today to talk about some ideas and strategies on how you too can reinvent yourself is Vince Volpe, who is the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship at St. Louis University John Cook School of Business. Now, Vince has been an attorney, an accountant, an investment banker, an operating manager, and management consultant, and now he is sharing all of that wisdom by teaching entrepreneurial studies at St. Louis University, and he's here to share that wisdom with us. Thanks for joining us, Vince. You're welcome. It's good to be here, Susan. 
So first of all, I see a lot of people who have had traditional career paths and they're saying, you know what, I'm tired, I may be the next pink slip victim, I'm going to reinvent myself, go out on my own. What are you seeing? Are you seeing more and more of these sort of transitions? I, I think we have seen a lot more of that in the last 20 or 30 years as uh, the economy has changed and uh, people uh, not only are outplaced, but people do begin to just look around even if they're otherwise in a job, they go look for something else. Uh, there's a, a sea change uh, after World War II. Uh, everybody had plenty of jobs and uh, we got away from our entrepreneurial roots and we're really getting back to it. It's not so much a new game as returning to something that's really foundational in America. So you do see a lot more of this, people that are willing to embrace that. And in general, you're seeing friends, family, and the business community being much more open to people becoming entrepreneurs. I know when I went away to college, my parents said, don't be an entrepreneur like we were. Go out and get a job, right. you know. So, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. it's changing, definitely. Yeah. What are some of the things that you should think about? Because obviously being an, empl an employee in the corporate world is very different. You're going to chuck your nine to five job, so to speak. What are some of the things you should consider? Yeah, well, actually, one of the things we recommend to people is that you, you probably shouldn't quit that nine to five job. Uh, you know, there are 168 hours in a week. And if you give yourself uh, 10 hours a day uh, for uh, sleep and other activities, you've got nearly 100 hours a week. And uh, especially if you're if you have the good fortune of being in a job that's maybe a full-time job that's 35 40 hours you do have a lot of other time and so we do recommend that rather than walk away from your full-time job you probably ought to be starting slowly and begin to what we'd call moonlight at your new uh, enterprise so you just have to put in a little extra hours and just see if it's going to work yeah very much uh, rather than walk away from a paycheck and uh, the health insurance and all the benefits maybe you should take it slowly uh, there is a tendency that I, I'm gonna go do this I'm gonna jump in today and with both feet but maybe that's not the wisest path which actually brings me to my next question because I see a lot of times people who want to start their own business they just get starry-eyed they're yes. so excited and yes. and no matter what you say they're just ready to get going how do you evaluate your business idea and find out whether it's going to work before you jump? Yeah, exactly. We see a lot of starry-eyed uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and, and that's important. In order to be successful, you have to believe in yourself and be very passionate about your idea. But I think the answer to that question is you want to talk to prospective customers. You want to talk to prospective vendors. You want to talk to, if you can, competitors. And sometimes you can do that by talking to people who would be uh, in the same business in a, in a different market, so they're not truly your competitors. Uh, you want to just talk to a lot of people and do a lot of listening. And again, because of that passion, very often we find uh, part of the uh, profile of an unsuccessful entrepreneur is someone who is so passionate about their ideas, they fail to listen to some of the advice they're being given along the way. You have an excellent educational background, lots of business experience, and you teach at the academic level now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of entrepreneurs are starting out, they're good at what they do, they know their skill or yeah. how to deliver that product, but then when you say to them, you need to write a business plan, it absolutely overwhelms them. How important is that, and can, is that something that someone without a business background can do? Uh, definitely. There's no doubt in our MBA programs or undergraduate programs, we do offer business planning courses, and I do teach that at St. Louis University. But even with my students, I'll emphasize that even if we give you an A on this business plan at the end of the semester, that doesn't mean that tomorrow that business plan may be out of date. Uh, there's a quote, and I can't remember it exactly, from Eisenhower that said, in, in planning for battle, I often found that plans were useless, but planning was essential. And, and it's really the planning that's important, uh, the understanding of everything. Because as you point out, many entre most entrepreneurs come to the business with some technical, scientific, marketing, sales background, and a business plan forces you to focus on the entire range of issues you're going to face as an entrepreneur, as opposed to only the thing that you're very good at. And of course, one of the elements of a business plan is looking at the capital needs, the startup projections, et cetera. And something else that people say to me a lot of times is, oh, well, I'll just go out and find some investors. You're an investment banker in the right. past. How realistic is that? Uh, it's very unrealistic. Um, part of the risk of being an entrepreneur is finding that capital. Uh, banks just don't, and they're not set up to finance startup companies. It'd be very rare that a bank is going to provide a loan to a company that has really not generated revenue yet. 
So what we always talk about are the three F's. You look at the founders, you look at the family members, and you look at friends. Sometimes we say there's a fourth F, fools, <laughs> uh, but frankly, that fourth F probably is the first three get covered in that. Uh, so really, it's the person you see in the mirror every morning is the person you're probably going to depend on for uh, a lot of sweat equity, plus some capital, and then family and friends. There's a lot of talk uh, among people about angel money or venture capital money. Uh, the more sophisticated, organized angel money is looking for game-changing type of businesses and technologies. Uh, th those uh, groups will see hundreds of applications and only invest in a few percentage points of those. Uh, likewise, venture capital is for further along, and again, they're looking for the big winners. Most business ideas, and this is not a bad thing, are, are not going to be going to change the economic landscape. And so therefore, you're going to have to rely on the, the three Fs and then eventually generate enough money from the business itself. Yeah, I tell you what, there are only so many Googles out there, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there's, uh, I think there is also a misunderstanding. There are, there are, because we've gone through a period in our history where there's been so much innovation or talk about innovation, uh, there's now a lot of research that shows most successful businesses are based on imitation, not innovation. That they take some service or product that already exists, and they're not making the headlines uh, as the name that invented this, but they're improving it, and they are often the companies that make the most money. Is that right? Yes. So not necessarily the first to market, but the person who gets it right the second exactly. time around. Okay. Now, we've been talking a lot about second chapter entrepreneurs or people who have had some business experience, but because you're teaching and in the mm -hmm. academic field and much differently, as I was saying, my parents said, don't go do what we did, go right. get a good job somewhere. Um, do you, are you seeing more and more young people saying, you know what, I'm not going to go to work for that traditional career, I want to start my own deal? Well, we do see that, and, and uh, of course, the, the sad thing is with the bad economy, maybe we're seeing more of that. but. I think, once again, where there's this sea change in an attitude about entrepreneurship, and you're seeing that at the universities, too, where students are more willing to explore that. Uh, but there's also no doubt that it's very difficult, no matter how bright a student you are or hardworking, to go off and start a business right out of college. So we really do recommend um, that people go off and get some experience, see how a business works. Because that when you talk to so many uh, successful entrepreneurs, they will talk about how important that was. Having said that, we do have students at St. Louis University. Uh, every year, we seem to have one or two students that go off and try their hand at starting a business, and, and many are very successful. I, I will have to say you've done a good job. You've, you've launched a few good businesses. Thank you. Yes, We're very yes. proud of that. You, I also know, Vince, that you do a lot of mentoring, and I, I've read a lot of research that says businesses, uh, at every stage, really, if you have a mentor who can help you, that it makes a difference, is that also something that you find to be true? Yeah, it, it is very true. Um, and, and in fact, I, I really can't think of any profession in life where having a, a, a mentor isn't a tremendous idea. Um, and uh, once again, for uh, students or people, second chapter, somebody has already gone out and done it. Somebody who's been there, who's taken that trek and come back and tell you what equipment you need to pack for the journey is very important. And, and I think you find them um, through certainly professors. Some of us are sought out as mentors. But we have a, a wonderful network in the community. We bring, we bring students together with a lot of people. Uh, and then just simply networking on your own, a very valuable tool to learn uh, at any age. And very many people who are uh, second chapter entrepreneurs, that's something they have to learn because maybe they've had a very successful career where they've never had to network. They've been very successful without having to do that. Now as an entrepreneur, you need to go out and talk to a lot of people and find the mentors. I'm going to turn the table on you just a little mm -hmm. bit because you've had such a successful career. Um, just very quickly, what's the best business lesson that you've learned over your lifetime or your tenure in your career? You know, I, I think it's a lesson that y you read about this and I've heard about it from a number of people and I would have to say it's true is that you are, uh, since we have to work so many years, we're blessed with long lives and we end up working a lot of years, you really want to find something that you're passionate about. Uh, it's so easy to fall into the trap of beginning to do something that 
I'm, I'm good at it, I'm okay at it, I don't love it. But the people you meet who just get excited to get up every day are the people who are doing what they love. And so that'd be the number one lesson, I think. I think I always say passion is life's energy. That's what lets you burn the candle at both Absolutely. ends, right? Absolutely. Yes. Vince, thank you very much. You've offered some great suggestions and advice here. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a link to the Entrepreneurial Studies program at St. Louis University on yes. our website. Excellent. So that they can find more information and find more about you if they like. So, thank you very much. Great. And be sure to check out our website, which is itsyourbiz.com. You'll find more tips and tools and resources there, as long as li to links like to the Entrepreneurial Studies program at St. Louis University. And also, you can ask us questions on the website. You could also offer story ideas there as well.